During the last century, India saw the world's largest growth in number of citizens, with its population rising by 700 million people. At the same time, the middle class was rapidly growing, seeing 50% of the population reach this target in the last decade. What is a major thing that comes with economic development and increased financial freedom? the desire to travel, whether for leisure or so-called VFR, which stands for visiting family and friends. What happens when you suddenly have hundreds of millions of people who want to travel, who just a decade earlier could not afford to do so? What a paradise for an airline. Imagine the potential for growth to increase market presence and create a strong foothold in the growing population. Now is the time to create loyalty and a robust network. So why is it then that India has only a couple of airlines that even occasionally turn a profit? Not only that, but why do Indian airlines keep going bankrupt? The demand is there, so what is causing airlines to suffer? Especially with fewer than a dozen airlines in a country whose population is over 1.3 billion. The answer is not simple, but I've done days and days of research and found a few reasons to highlight, though there are of course many more. You guys reacted so positively to my previous educational video about Etihad, which made me so happy. The second part of this video will be a case study on Jet Airways, which will be published as soon as this gets 7,500 likes. To be able to support me with the significant amount of time it takes to make these videos, I'm grateful for my sponsor, Dashlane. So let me share a time-saving tip with you. Download Dashlane. Most of us have dozens if not hundreds of website logins nowadays. This usually means a variety of passwords to match the different requirements of different websites as well. Well, Dashlane makes managing your passwords easy. You can import them all instantly via your email address, scan them for security breaches, and instantly change them to something stronger. Not only are Dashlane the leading password manager, but they'll also autofill your passwords, your address, your ID information, and much more, making browsing and shopping simpler. So download Download Dashlane for free on your first device by going to dashlane.com slash nonstopdan and you can use code nonstopdan to get 10% off premium and use Dashlane anywhere. So why is the Indian aviation market particularly challenging? Aside from the current issues with COVID-19, which is affecting the entire industry, just like last time, it helps to go back and see where it all started. In 1953, India had eight domestic airlines, all of which you've likely never heard of. Given that the industry was growing, the government decided to take control and they merged the airlines into two entities, the domestic airline named Indian Airlines and the international airline we all know and love today, Air India. The civil aviation sector was not deregulated again until 1991, which saw the formation of several small domestic airlines. In the next decade, the Indian aviation market changed drastically. Here's when most airlines we know today started to appear, such as Jet Airways, SpiceJet, Indigo, Go Air, Kingfisher, and more. So you'll start to see a pattern in this video, but it was during this time that the government introduced one of the first regulations, the so-called 520 rule. This rule mandated that airlines needed to operate domestically for at least five years before they could launch international service, and that they needed a fleet of at least 20 aircraft to do so, hence 520. This benefited existing player Air India and gave them several years to spot and try to outcompete new entrants. The 520 rule ensured connectivity within the country and forced airlines to find and operate profitable domestic routes to benefit the local economy, all while growing in what was intended to be a healthy and economically sustainable way. Well, the Indian aviation market, despite the growing middle class, definitely isn't very high yield. This means that margins are usually low. In comparison, international routes can tap into lucrative foreign business markets if done successfully. As we'll see, not many airlines have succeeded with international service from India either though, more on that later. So this theme of intense government regulation in the industry continues in other places and seems to end with the government reversing or changing their original stamp. The 520 rule, for example, has now scrapped the five-year requirement to make it easier for new entrants to operate profitably. To understand the next seemingly bizarre government policy, we need to gain a better understanding of the Indian passenger market. The Economic Times claims that India was found to have the cheapest airfares in a list of 43 countries, with prices decreasing further every year. The reason for this? The fast-growing, price-sensitive middle class. It seems that airlines have figured that it's more profitable to fill many planes with cheap seats rather than fewer planes with seats at premium prices 
presumably because of the low yield traffic. Not only that, but when more than half the aviation market is controlled by low cost carriers, it becomes very difficult for full service carriers to compete as we've seen in Europe as well. So how are these low cost airlines that are pretty much controlling the Indian market doing? If they're driving down prices so much, are they able to be profitable? The answer is sometimes. India's two largest airlines, Indigo and Spicejet, are the only consistently profitable airlines in the country, but even they have weak periods. For example, despite massive undercapacity in 2019, Indigo managed to make a loss. Meanwhile, Air Asia India, Vistara, and Air India all struggle with profitability, especially the latter two, which are the only major full-service airlines still operating. This video is just a trail of questions, but it's leading us to understand more and more layers of the issues facing Indian airlines. But logically, we have to ask, if the Indian market is so large, how can almost all players be consistently losing money? How on earth is there not a single airline that is able to consistently succeed in the way that Delta is succeeding in the US, for example? The first reason is that low-cost carriers are competing so fiercely that margins are paper thin. This is where regulations become a problem again. Airplane fuel accounts for 34% of operating costs in India due to a bunch of external factors, including government intervention, while the global average is only 24%. That 10% difference is huge, especially since fuel is a fixed cost. Full-service airlines have higher costs than low-cost carriers in almost all areas. Let's give an ultra-simplified example. If a fare from Hyderabad to Ahmedabad is $100, both a full-service airline and a low-cost airline will pay $34 in fuel. Then, the full-service airline might pay $10 in staff costs per ticket, $2 for food, and $4 for additional airport service. Meanwhile, the low-cost airline might only pay $7 for staff, nothing for food, and $2 for airport service. This means the cost for the full-service carrier is $50, while the cost for the low-cost carrier is only $43. So what happens if the low-cost carrier decides to undercut their full service competitor on price by charging $44 for a ticket. Sure, they won't make much profit, but their competitor doesn't stand a chance. Instead, they'll be operating a route with a half-empty aircraft, but the fixed fuel cost of $34 remains, instead of $24 in other parts of the world. This means it's much easier to lose significant amounts of money in fuel on unprofitable routes in India. The second reason is the 2016 initiative called UDAN, which stands for this. Udadeshka Amnagrik. So sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> Basically, out of 486 airports in India that participated in the program, 406 were not served by any flights at all. Only 27 of those 486 were considered well served. The goal of the program is to bring service to 425 of these airports, which is an incredibly ambitious goal. So what does the program entail? Well, airlines will receive waived fees and subsidies in exchange for launching these routes. In theory, that could mean that airlines get more profit on new routes, incentivizing them to enter new markets. Well, the problem is that Udon Project caps prices, where 50% of the seats on a flight need to be sold at a maximum fare of 2,500 rupees per hour of flight time. The other issue is that these unserved airports often have lacking infrastructure and are unreachable with common A320s or 737s. Even if they are, airlines might not be able to fill aircraft of this size. To successfully operate Udon routes, low-cost carriers also need to be large enough to achieve economies of scale. Several airlines have relied on Udon for their survival, but subsidies promised on these routes have been underpaid. As a result, airlines have been forced to cease operations. TrueJet, for example, based in Hyderabad where I lived for a little while, went bankrupt as soon as COVID-19 hit, since the government wasn't paying the Udon benefits. But it gets worse. Instead of connecting the country, Udon has had a negative impact on the aviation industry. Airlines have used Udon to gain additional slots at congested tier 1 airports like Mumbai and Delhi, creating monopolies on many routes, and their finances are aided by the economies of scale they can achieve at their hubs. This often means it's impossible for new entrants to gain access to India's more lucrative markets. Out of 705 routes assigned by the government under Udon, less than 26% have actually been flown, many of which are served by Air India subsidiary Alliance Air at a loss using taxpayer money. So basically, the idea is good in theory, and of course it has good intentions. Smaller communities need this connectivity desperately. However, a route cannot operate unless there is one of two things, either 
proper demand at a profitable price, or heavy government subsidies to support airlines. Without reliable subsidies, small airlines cannot survive, and larger airlines are understandably more interested in serving higher yield markets. So which markets are actually profitable to Indian carriers? Well, that would be Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, and a few other big cities. Looking to Mumbai, this shows a third reason why airlines have a difficult time profiting despite the enormous market. In this city of over 20 million, there's only one big commercial airport. Not only that, but it only has one active runway, which is truly inconceivable. Compare that to New York, which has three major airports, London, which has five, and even Stockholm has two, with one-tenth of Mumbai's population. If there were two airports in Mumbai, capacity could double, which I suspect would especially benefit full-service airlines. Given the small size of Mumbai's airport, there is not the same capacity for an international hub as in other foreign cities. Being able to shuttle passengers via Mumbai to all of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East could be hugely beneficial, but no airline can create such a network with the current infrastructure. Now lastly, why do they not succeed on long haul? We've spoken about how these routes can at least tap into more profitable foreign business markets. Well, my next educational video will be a case study of India's second largest airline, Jet Airways, that went bankrupt last year, going into detail about all the corruption and issues that faced the large international airline. So if you're not already subscribed, make sure you do that and turn on notifications so you find out when that video comes out. So since you've watched this, you'll really benefit from this knowledge watching the second video, and I'll be doing a massive giveaway in the first 24 hours that that video launches, so stay tuned. Now internationally, I expect the reasons for the failure of India's carriers is less direct. Much of it has to do with the lack of connectivity as mentioned above. If you can't create a properly banked schedule where all domestic flights arrive at a certain time to funnel passengers into your international network, you'll have a harder time filling planes. There's also a perception in India that international carriers are better, as well-established international companies like British Airways and Lufthansa are often preferred over Air India and previously Jet Airways. And with the growth of Qatar Airways, Emirates, Etihad, and Turkish, there are even more quality competitors for Indian airlines wishing to operate westbound routes. But wouldn't Indian carriers have lower costs than European competitors? Not when it comes to fuel, as we've mentioned. These costs largely mitigate savings in crew and service costs. Keep in mind that British Airways and Lufthansa also have far greater economies of scale, given the vast sizes of their long-haul networks, which Indian carriers simply don't have. The other reasons Indian airlines struggle internationally will be covered in my upcoming Jet Airways video Video, so I won't give it all away quite yet. To round up this video, what are the reasons Indian airlines struggle so much with profitability? Mainly, it's a combination of poor government policies affecting fuel costs, the ability to launch international service, and the poor economics of most Indian routes. We also can't overlook the power of low-cost airlines in this primarily leisure-based aviation market, driving down prices to points where most airlines don't stand a chance at profitability. However, all is not lost. The government recently changed the 524 rule as I told you earlier, but there is also mounting criticism of the way Udan is set up, which could lead to changes in modest subsidies, hopefully enabling more airlines to fly to small markets with greater success. There are also many airports in development across the country. Mumbai plans to open the new Navi airport in 2023, which would eventually increase the city's capacity by 90 million passengers per year. This is still far from enough, especially with only two runways, but it is a good start. Once airlines can establish profitable hubs connecting big cities with unserved markets and feed passengers to international networks, they have a better chance at overall profitability. So I really hope you guys learned something interesting in this video. The Indian aviation market is so incredibly complex and different from many other parts of the world, so there is a lot to cover, a lot that I couldn't cover here, but I mentioned a couple of the big regulations that are good to know about and the really effective airlines operations. As I mentioned, this will be really useful base knowledge for you guys when I go into the case of Jet Airways in my next video as soon as this one hits 7,500 likes. Once again, to make your life a whole lot easier, I recommend checking out today's video sponsor Dashlane. Gotta thank them for supporting me as always. And thank you guys so much for the positive feedback on these videos. It really means a lot. So I can't wait to see you all in the next one and my next real life video, whether that's a review or something else. But until then, Stay safe and fly safe.